Welcome back, guys. In this segment of the lecture, we're going to talk about chest wall trauma um, and traumatic injuries to the chest. Couldn't think of a better way to start this off than with uh, this clip from the classic test match between England and Australia. Uh, this is actually the, uh, the first time, I believe, Aust uh, England had beaten Australia um, in Australia. Um, so I think the, you know, they've been trying since the 1963, um, and they hadn't done it for 40 years up until this uh, match, uh, which was leading up to the, the Rugby World Cup, which uh, England won that year. So um, we'll play this here. So Matt Rogers is the player for Australia. He's getting a cheap shot there. Josh Lucy is one of the uh, fullbacks for England. Got a little, little bit of vengeance there. Just to let you know, uh, the rib fractures Matt Rogers sustained, um, you know, apparently didn't heal um, correctly, and apparently he's no was no longer able to surf. They interviewed him like five years later after that tackle, and like, yeah, I'm still having lingering issues from that from that was rib fractures that happened uh, during that tackle. So I guess uh, you know, karma happens sometimes. I guess, but he, he's doing well now. So. Rib fractures are pretty pretty common bony injuries. The most common bony injury, obviously, in, in chest trauma. Um, it's pretty rare in children. Um, it's because children typically have more elastic ribs than adults do. Uh, therefore, kids are less likely to sustain rib fractures. They're able to absorb some of those uh, blows. Um, just from playing around as they do with their friends or falling and rolling around. Uh, however, you know if, if it does occur in a child, and again, they're not like playing a sport, you don't witness it, um, it raises suspicion for child abuse because you know it, it takes a lot to, to for a rib, for a kid to fracture a rib. Uh, the symptoms are you know if anyone's had a bruised rib or a fractured rib, it's exact almost the exact same condition, but uh, it's going to be painful, right? Um, that's because essentially we've fractured a bone and then we're mobilizing it. The thing that you're supposed to like never do with a fractured uh, bone is to move it. You're supposed to keep it, you know, in line, you know, immobilize it, uh, prevent it from being stretched or tensioned. Can't really do that um, with your ribs because they're always expanding and contracting as we breathe. So they're going to have pain. It's going to be tender, like it would be with any 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 fracture or bruising. Um, there's going to be some guarding, meaning that they'll, you'll probably see people hunched over, putting their hand over the side where it's injured, brace it a little bit. It's actually kind of what we do for treatment. Um, just uh, people tend to do this reflexively to support the rib that's, that's broken or bruised. Um, and you, know, you might see some, uh, some bruising or ecchymosis um, around the area of injury. Now, um, while I mentioned it's rare in kids, um, you can see it um, in sports. Um, we're particularly concerned of rib fractures in the elderly due to some of the issues they already have with, with respiration, changes in compliance. Um, but uh, rib fractures are pretty, pretty associated, strongly associated with mortality in ribs. And it usually typically occurs in concert with a fall. So you usually have other issues going on there. Um, but you know, rib fractures in, a, in an older patient, it really is no laughing matter and not something to take lightly. Um, in uh, most people, ribs four through 10, which are kind of the middle ribs in, in some respects, the ribs 11 and 12, of course, are floating ribs. They don't typically get injured as much. Um, and ribs four to, four to 10 are kind of what are exposed in, in most situations. Now, if people have upper rib fractures, that typically only occurs in like a high energy trauma, like a car crash or something of that nature. So that's a little bit rarer, they're a little bit harder to break. Um, and if you have a lower rib fracture, um, you know, 10 through 12, really, we have a, there's a higher risk potentially for, for an intra-abdominal injury. So that could be, a, um, you know, a lacerated organ like a kidney, a liver, or even the lungs potentially if it's displaced enough. Um, so again, you know, rib fractures, um, again, you know, that's, you know, it's, it, in most situations, it, there, it's, you're treating this symptomatically. We're not, you know, unless it's displaced. And we'll go over another particular uh, condition, with, which is very concerning. Um, but, you know, it's going to be painful. We're going to brace it, splint it, and just kind of hope the bones heal on their own. 
a um, little bit concerning, again, if it's in a kid, and especially in the elderly due to the risk of mortality. Uh, of kid, the presence in kids, of course, may be suspicious of child abuse. Now, flail chest um, is a situation where we have uh, multiple fractures, uh, potentially multiple ribs. So it's either fractures in two or more locations on the same rib, so it's broken in two places, so the, you know, the ribs, you know, its, it's integrity is significantly impaired, um, or uh, it's multiple ribs, um, either on the anterior or ch uh, lateral chest. Will, um, so the long story short, what this creates is an, is an unstable chest wall, a chest wall that's not going to be moving in unison with the rest of the, the thoracic wall. Um, so what you end up seeing is a paradoxical movement. So during inspiration, the area where the fracture is, it'll actually fall in, in as opposed to expanding. So we'll draw, you know, kind of highlight this here. So it'll fall in because it's not really kind of, um, you know, it's not in line or you know, connected really to the rest of the chest wall. Um, and during expiration, it'll bow out, it'll flail out. So we call it a flail chest because we see this flailing in and flailing out flailing in during inspiration. Again, that's the opposite of what it should be doing. It should be going out during inspiration in the chest wall. And during expiration, we end up seeing it flail, um, uh, if it flails out, right? As opposed to you know, moving back in, right? And it's because the, the fractures cause the, the, the ribs along there being unison or connected to the rest of the ribs. So again, the flail chest, um, the chest wall falls in when it's supposed to be falling out during expiration, it falls out when it's supposed to be falling back in or moving back towards um, towards the lungs. So you have this unequal chest wall expansion, which can create a VQ mismatch in that area, in, you know, impaired ventilation in those segments where it's fractured, um, can impair pulmonary drainage. Uh, and again, if it's a really, if it's, you know, you know depending on where it's located, um, you can see kidney you know, lacerations, liver lacerations, uh, the lungs, potentially the bowels, um, similar to other, um, you know, ribs, we can possibly um, we're gonna have pain, maybe some hyperventilation. Um, and if it's severe enough, can potentially lead to respiratory failure. I'll talk about what that means in a bit later on. But again, if we have multiple, multiple ribs fractured and we're not able to ventilate, they're not, do, they're not able to move in concert, um, you know, during, during breathing, it's going to really impair our ability to ventilate and exchange gases. Um, and again, you know, it, it, the mortality rate can be pretty high. Um, we see you know, 10, 10 to 15 percent, um, you know, patients who just sustain flail chest, um, you know, end up dying. So mortality is 10, 10 to 15 percent due to flail chest. And, then, and again, that's usually happening in concert with you know, a high impact trauma. So there's usually something else going on. Uh, but again, the mortality rate is 10 to 15 percent. Now, pneumothorax we'll talk about as well. So we, we see this um, can, can be caused by trauma as well. There are some other causes we'll go over in a bit. Um, so pneumothorax is the presence of air or blood. Um, in a blood, we would call it a hemothorax, a hemo, hemothorax, right? Hemothorax um, in the pleural space. And it can occur either as a breach in the parietal or the visceral pleura. Um, so basically what ends up happening um, with a pneumothorax specifically, because the hemothorax again is a little bit different, we have an infiltration of air into the pleural space. Remember, the pleural space should typically be closed to the atmosphere. And that's important because if it's closed to the atmosphere and the way it's kind of oriented, it creates this negative pressure environment that allows the lungs to stay inflated. Right. It also permits, you know, allows the lungs to kind of expand as a, as the thoracic wall expands. Um, so if we open the chest wall to the atmosphere, or we open, sorry, we open the, or puncture the pleural space, you know, and expose it to the atmosphere, what happens is the pressure in the pleural space equalizes to atmospheric pressure, and we've got a problem. Because now no, no longer are the lungs sitting in a negative pressure environment. And what ends up happening is uh, we, you know, impair the ability for the lung to expand and we may end up causing compression. So what ends up happening is the ipsilateral lung collapses. And if it continues to worsen, we can end up seeing a shifting 
of the of the media sino context. And I'll go over what that means in a bit, but the pressure is so high on one side, it can press and push the, the lung on the other side, which is at a lower pressure, compressing the, you know, the all the vasculature, even the heart, impairing you know, our ability to pump blood as well. So the early signs are dyspnea. So they got, you know, again, anytime someone has dyspnea, think of the respiratory system, so difficulty breathing. They'll have a sharp um, and sudden, you know, pain, tachycardia, probably related to a little bit of the pain and anxiety, potentially due to as well, um, you know, what's happening to the heart in later stages. Tachypnea, they'll be breathing at a faster rate because they've lost effectively one side or half the lung of ventilation. So to make up for that, the lack of volume, we've got to breathe at a faster rate to maintain minute ventilation. We'll have decreased breath sounds over that side because there is no ventilation. Decreased chest expansion, again, because the pleural space is gone. Remember the pleural space and changing the pressure in the pleural space, making it more negative, allows the lungs to expand. In that situation with a pneumothorax, it's equalized to atmospheric, and it's, it's not going to change, right? Especially if we have an opening now as well. And they may actually have decreased pox, pulse oximetry due to the um, loss of ventilation and potentially compression um, leading to hypoxia. So if we see pulse oximetry decrease, you know, that should raise your suspicions as well, especially if they have other things that may uh, increase risk. We'll talk about that in a bit. And then um, in very late and severe cases, we will see a drop in blood pressure, that tracheal shift, and then potentially jugular vein distension if the heart is really compressed by that um, compression of the lung. Okay, from the lung in a, in a side where there's a pneumothorax is at a higher pressure that, you know, than it is on the other side, causing, again, pressure goes from high to low. So um, there are several different causes and mechanisms. So there are primary, so that's, you know, something that, um, you know, we see this in patients with no underlying lung disease. It's more common in, in younger, uh, tall, thin males. There are secondary pneumothoraxes, which are associated with an underlying disease like COPD. We see this. It's related to some of the blebs and the bullae that occur during emphysema. We talked about how, like, it could either be, you know, um, a penetration from the, you know, from the outside wall, chest wall, to the, you know, through the parietal pleura or through the visceral pleura from the lungs. That's what happens here with COPD. Uh, there can be iatrogenic um, causes. So that's something that's due to a diagnostic or medical procedure. It's a term for anything that's iatrogenic, so you know, related to healthcare. Um, the most common causes of that in, in, uh, for iatrogenic causes are um, a, a needle aspiration or biopsy of the lung, uh, central line placement, so a subclavian line or jugular vein line placement, um, and even thoracic and teeth is potentially cause um, a pneumothorax as well. Now, obviously there are uh, secondary causes um, for this, so a, um, you know, um, or other causes, traumatic causes to this. So that can be um, from a penetrating wound or non-penetrating uh, chest trauma. So penetrating wounds um, allow air to enter from the pleural space through the chest wall or through the visceral wall um, or from the, trachea, uh, from the tracheobronchial tree. And then non-penetrating develops with the visceral pleura is lacerated, secondary rib fracture and uh, fracture or dislocation. So uh, traumatic, there can be, you know, there can be penetrating wounds and non-penetrating wounds that lead to a, a pneumothorax. Uh, pneumothorax can also be classified as an open um, wound. So we call that a, a sucking wound where there's like a, a hole, basically, um, or a closed wound, which is there's an intact thoracic, thoracic cage. So no, no lesion to the thoracic wall. Now, um, in terms of severity, there's really kind of two types. There's a simple pneumothorax where there is no mediastinal shift. Um, again, like, you know, if they have, there's a, there's a, you know, air in the pleural space, not too severe, you know, no mediastinal shift, might have some dyspnea. Now, there are, um, the other var uh, variant of that is a tension pneumothorax. This is a medical emergency. This is a big, big concern. There are many calls of it, uh, most notably in trauma. So when this happens, again, it could be a disruption of either the visceral pleura, parietal pleura, or tracheobronchial tree, essentially what happens is you have a one-way valve that forms that allows air into the pleural space and prohibits air flowing out of the pleural space. So what ends up happening, it just builds and builds and builds pressure. 
um, in that side of where the lesion is located, where that valve is located, and it gets, you know, the pressure gets higher and higher and higher, um, and, you know, eventually starts shifting over this, um, you know, you know, and compressing the contralateral side. This is a medical emergency. When we talk about when we see blood pressure dropping, when we see um, JVD, it's because of the higher pressure in this side, right, causing a compression, a shift of the mediastinum, compressing the heart, compressing the other lung, compressing even the airways, causing the trachea itself to shift as well. So in a normal thorax, um, the general rule of thumb is the the trachea shifts to the side contralateral away from the side of the lesion. Okay, so this is another image here again looking at a pneumothorax. Again, it's occurring on this side. Um, you actually see the diaphragm is much lower because of the lung, you know, the pressure is now higher. Um, and what we also observe is the, again, uh, this, this shifting of the of the um, mediastinal contents and again you know, compression even the pulmonary vasculature a bit here as well so that's an example again mediastinal shift and this is just an example again looking at this you know, comparison so here's another example again just kind of what we can see of an open sucking wound so again we have a valve essentially that brings air in from the outside and you know there is no escape there's always air uh, constantly um, contained within the, uh, the, the airway and it eventually it builds up to a point um, and we don't have uh, you know, any way for it to escape and the compression gets worse and worse and worse. To treat it, what we end up doing is inserting in a needle to uh, uh, normalize pressure um, like a chest tube, again, to help reinflate the lung. So again, tension pneumothorax, medical emergency, that's, again, when that one-way valve forms. And the clinical representation for any pneumothorax is that sharp, sudden chest pain, dyspnea, tachypnea, um, and decreased pulse oximetry, decreased chest expansion. If it gets later and severe, um, you know, later or severe, you can see blood pressure drop as well, JVD, neck veins, um, you know, uh, expand, um, and, it, and that tracheal shift. Okay, so that is chest wall trauma in a nutshell.